Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Ayurveda and the uh, language and symbols of creation that it uses. And so I'll be going through a uh, PowerPoint, and it may make sense just to um, maybe go through the slides that I have and then uh, stop and open for uh, discussion just so there's some kind of continuity of the various points um, that I want to make. But if it, along the way any of you are um, you know, lost at all, uh, feel free to just open your mic and ask a question. Okay, so um, let me just uh, open up and share the uh, PowerPoint that we're going to go through and introduce the, the topic for today. So uh, today, what, what I'd like to do is to uh, take a look at Ayurveda. Uh, many of you have probably heard a little bit about Ayurveda and even be familiar with it. Uh, for those of you who are not, um, Ayurveda is uh, an ancient Indian modality of health and healing. Um, and the actual term Ayurveda translates as the knowledge of life, right? So Ayur being life and Vidya being knowledge or wisdom. And so in a way, this means that Ayurveda is actually more than just a system of health and healing. It's, uh, it's an approach to life. It's a lifestyle, if you will. And it shows us how to be in harmony. Uh, with ourselves, our body, mind, and soul, but also as importantly, how to live in harmony with others and with our environment and even with the planets. So it's truly a holistic approach to, to life. And uh, I'm not aware that there are others, um, ancient modalities like this, but uh, surely there, there must be. And I know uh, Teresa and Charles are here they are schooled in the uh, TCM, and so we'll be very interested uh, in their uh, comments and comparisons. Um, but for uh, for myself, you know, it's Ayurveda is what uh, I studied uh, for a couple of years out in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, at Dr. Lodge. Let me just admit uh, our new here uh, at Dr. Lodge uh, Institute. And uh, at the time, I was a Jyotishi, a Vedic astrologer. So my use uh, of this was to really combine the Ayurvedic uh, consultation uh, with the Vedic birth chart, which is exactly what Dr. Lan does. So, you know, I chose, I chose this topic um, because I felt uh, when we came to the subject of symbols and language that it would be a great illustration of how Ayurveda incorporates both the language and the symbols of, of creation. And you'll see that there's kind of this perfect alignment uh, between the two as we go through. What I'd like to do maybe before we get into the actual topic is just give a, a brief overview of the origin um, of Ayurveda. Yeah, I have to get that out of the way. Okay. Um, so what we have here is uh, a timeline uh, from India and some of the uh, scriptures at various time periods. And what you'll see is that these two green ones uh, at the end, Charaka Samhita and Shishuta Samhita, somewhere around 400 to 600 BC, these are what we refer to as the classical uh, Ayurvedic uh, texts or scriptures. And so many people uh, view Ayurveda as being introduced to the world around this 400 to 500 time period. Um, but actually, uh, uh, if you go back to the Vedas, you know, we had the earliest Veda here you see in orange being Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yaja Veda, and Atarva Veda, the four uh, orange ones. And if you go back to the Atarva Veda, which is the fourth Veda, you'll see that this, uh, this Veda was actually about health and healing and, and even more than health and healing. It, it also was a holistic approach to life in that it included relationships, marriage, uh, ecology, um, uh, philosophy in it. And so for my, in my mind, uh, Ayurveda really 
got its roots or has its origins in the Atarva Veda. And, um, and I would even go so far as to say that uh, it's really its roots go as far back as the Rig Veda. Because you'll see that, uh, you know, almost 60% of the hymns in the Atarva Veda are sourced from the Rig Veda. And this Rig Veda uh, being the oldest uh, spiritual scripture in, in India and, and probably the world. So, um, so it's very, very ancient uh, modality that clearly changes and modifies with time and even continues to date to, to change and, and modify. So let's, um, let's see how the language and symbols that are used by Ayurveda are the same as those in creation. And um, to, to uh, change the slide here. And uh, in order to do this, we'll need to, to take a look at creation. So in the uh, Vedic scriptures, there are many uh, different descriptions or ways that creation has been described. Um, if we look at one of the oldest descriptions, which is the uh, famous Nasadiya hymn in the Rig Veda, you know, here we have a Rishi who has this vision of the early stages of creation. And his vision includes what appears to him to be this vast, endless, kind of motionless uh, sea of water. But then he notices something. Something stirs in the depths of that sea. And the Rishi perceives a subtle urge or uh, a desire, a vague desire, that actually created the ripple in the waters. And with that ripple, the process of creation begins. Um, I think Vladimir mentioned a little bit uh, last, uh, last time that uh, this, this urge or desire that we see in almost uh, all the ancient uh, Indian uh, stories around creation was really the desire for that one, that one who was motionless, right, in that vast sea to, to know and to experience uh, all his forms, all his infinite personalities. And for that reason, uh, that desire creates a ripple and we have the beginning of creation. Now, Sri Aurobindo, in his commentary on the Isha Upanishad refers to another yet a very similar image of creation. And this will look familiar to everyone. Um, and here, you know, we've got the uh, Puranic image of Vishnu as the eternal one. And uh, although he's not asleep here, uh, originally he is asleep on the waveless waters of creation here. And then we see the snake Ananta and all his many, many coils that makes up the bed for Vishnu. And actually Ananta means the infinite. So it's only when Vishnu awakens as he opens his eyes that the snake Ananta stirs and the first ever ripple is created on the surface of the waters, which begins the evolution of matter. And Sri Aurobindo refers to the waveless waters of creation here in the Puranic uh, image of Vishnu as the causal ocean. And uh, he describes it, and actually it was a rishi, he is commenting uh, in the Ishi, Isha Upanishad, a rishi's uh, vision or experience, who, uh, who describes what he is seeing as uh, a matter, a substance that he says is so refined, um, it's so simple, it's so undeveloped. But in this causal ocean, what appears to be an ocean, that it's pregnant with the entire uh, material evolution. So it becomes this kind of the seed state or causal state of matter. And obviously, we can notice the symbolism between uh, these uh, two stories of creation. You know, they both uh, involve this kind of vast, um, immobile, watery-like substance perceived by, by both Rashis, the Rashis in the Rig Veda, as well as in the Isha Upanishad. And uh, they, they give this, uh, the, the symbol to this watery-like substance as this endless, calm sea. 
right? So we have this symbol now that is representing what the rishis ultimately say is um, a bliss-filled substance. Uh, no other distinguishing sensation that this ocean is, is pure bliss or pure love, if you will. Um, and, and so we see this in both, that creation started out of this substance that's so refined, that's so vast, um, that, that is composed of pure bliss, pure ananda, or pure love. And the other common symbol uh, between the two stories is a ripple, right? We see this ripple in the waters, it's motionless. And this ripple is a symbol for the stirring of the faint urge or desire that we spoke of. You know, in the Puranic image of, of Vishnu, as he opens his eyes, Snake Ananda stirs and it creates this ripple in the vast ocean. And although snake ananta symbolizes uh, many things, right? One of the things in general that uh, that a snake uh, symbolizes is desire. And so this stirring that begins the process of creation in both, both scenarios is that desire, like we said before, of that one to know and to experience his forms and endless personalities. So it's just a use, um, it's just also to demonstrate the use of, of symbols in many, many of these creation uh, images or many of the creation descriptions uh, that we find. And uh, although we won't do it at this time, um, we could spend quite a bit of time analyzing the rest of this picture of Vishnu and what each of the items in his hands uh, represents relative to creation um, we normally get uh, or see Lakshmi at his feet, which also is symbolic. Um, and, you know, Vladimir the other day mentioned also that, you know, Brahma, Brahma is taking birth from a lotus stem coming out of Vishnu's navel. Um, another uh, typical way uh, that creation is pictured. So all these are, are symbols. Um, but again, uh, what uh, I want to really move to is to elaborate a bit on what the rishis uh, cognized or perceived from this point on. So here, this first ripple or vibration in the ocean of causal matter, so you'll see the white uh, circle, causal matter at the bottom of the three, it creates this next state of matter. And the rishis end up uh, labeling this state or calling this state a subtle state of matter. And then from the subtle state of matter, then we see eventually the growth state of matter is created. So let me just admit this person. So the rishis perceived uh, three primary realms or conditions of matter, causal, subtle, and growth. And Sri Yogabindo adds that in this causal ocean of, of the substance, the substance that's pure bliss, pure love, that matter appears to the rishis to be so refined as to appear to be identical with spirit, right? In this causal state, spirit and matter appear to be one and the same. Because matter has come down to just the most fine, fine, uh, indistinguishable substance, if you will. And of course, at the opposite extreme, when we go out to the growth state of matter, we see spirit is so densified as to appear identical to matter. Right? But still, spirit and matter are one and the same reality. I want to focus in on the subtle state of matter because this is where uh, the preparation for gross manifestation is happening. And this is where we start to see, although we see it also in the causal, we start to see, um, I think somebody's got their mic open. Um, so the subtle state of, of matter is really where the preparation is occurring for the growth state of, of manifestation. And there's two important qualities in the subtle state of matter that we'll, we'll see is, um, is also foundational to Ayurveda. The, the first is that the uh, presence 
of what we know to be the gunas, right? Satwa, Rajas, and Thomas. This uh, as the ripple, uh, as the desire creates a ripple and the ripple spreads out into this uh, ocean that it releases the three, uh, or I should say this three gunas become active. They become dynamic. Sattva, Rajas, and Thomas. And we'll go through the three in a second for those that may not be familiar with these three. The other thing that the rishis uh, sensed or noticed was subtle elements um, in this, this subtle state of matter. And that these subtle elements, they call them tanmatras, they had each had their individual sense property, if you will. Their uh, the way in which the, the particular Tan Mantra could be recognized. And so for this, which, um, let's see. Oh, okay, now I'm gonna do the, uh, I'll do the three gunas uh, first. Um, so here what we have is this wonderful uh, Quote, although I've modified it a little bit just in rearranging it for the purpose of this discussion, uh, from Sri Aurobindo on the gunas, the three gunas. And what he says of these three gunas is that each is a reflection or a step-down version of a power of a higher level of existence. So typically, when we speak of Thomas, which is the first uh, first and lowest, if you will, we typically think of Thomas as inertia or dullness or even incapacity of action. But what Sri Aurobindo says is that there is um, on a higher existence, on a more spiritual existence, Thomas is really this divine calm and perfect power holding in itself all its capacity and capable of controlling and subjecting to the law of calm, even the most stupendous and enormous activity, right? So this is a little different than what we typically would define Thomas as. Uh, but what Sri Aurobindo is alerting us to here is that yes, as these gunas kind of play out in manifestation, their lower qualities come out, but at a higher level, a more spiritual level, we actually have kind of divine qualities around each of them. It's not that we all want to become sattvic, if you will, but no, they each play their role. And you can see the picture here. They're all, they're all three intertwined in part and in balance um, when they, they're into their divine state. And the second one is rajas. Now, rajas, again, we typically will say, well, it's desire, it's passion, it's ambition. Um, it's endeavor, but again, Sri Aurobindo says on a higher existence, it is a self-affecting, initiating, sheer will of the spirit and a perfect power capable of an infinite, steady, and blissful action, right? So the nature of that action, instead of desire and striving passion, now becomes steady and blissful action. And the third one, sattva, we normally think of it, well, it's, you know, it's harmony, it's balance, it's, you know, on, on in many ways, it's considered to be kind of a, what Shirobindo says, a modified mental light. But even on a higher existence, Shirobindo says, it is the self-existent light of the soul and its perfect power of being, which illumines and unifies the divine quietude, right? Divine quietude being Thomas and the divine will of action, divine will of action being rajas. And then he says something very interesting. He says, the ordinary liberation gets the still divine light, here's sattva, in the divine quietude, Thomas, but the integral perfection will aim at this great trinal unity, right? What, what the integral perfection is, is bringing in rajas, not just the divine light, not just the divine uh, quietude, but a higher integral liberation is really all three. We, we want also action, uh, in, living in, in the world, uh, if you will, uh, moving about in the world. 
and not just pure uh, leaving this world as, as a um, liberation. So I found this um, just a really, really powerful uh, uh, quote by Shri Aurobindo on the gunas. And, you know, in Ayurveda, this is really the first way in which the, uh, the quality and the attributes and the inclinations of the mind uh, is, uh, is evaluated. They look at the Sattva, Rajas, and Thomas uh, mix, if you will, of the person. And in classical texts, they actually, um, they actually mention 16 uh, psychological types, 16 different combinations of Sattva, Rajas, and Thomas that a person could have in terms of uh, his or her psychology. And what's so very interesting, since we're speaking on uh, symbols, is that in these classical texts, instead of describing each of these psychological types as we would normally in, in kind of plain English, if you will, they use symbols. And their symbols are based on various gods and asuras, right? So, so an example here is for the sattvic estate, which I think has eight or nine of the 16. One of the symbols, for the psychological uh, typecast is Indra, right? And the text doesn't go into a lot, but the text does say for Indra, what is the psychological orientation? It says it's a happy-go-lucky individual that's brave and outgoing. And then another one is Yama, Yama, uh, who is uh, Lord of, of, of Death in, in the older Puranic time, and more recent Puranic time. And here, for example, it says the traits of this individual is characterized as readiness for action, freedom from attachment, et cetera. So they just give a couple brief uh, definitions around the symbol that they're using, which in the sattvic case is the gods. As we go into the uh, Rajas and Thomas symbols, they become more the Osiric type. So Ayurveda, again, 16 psychological types that are used around Sattva, Rajas, and Thomas in uh, categorizing uh, mental orientation of individuals. So now we go to the second aspect uh, of what the Rishis cognized or perceived in this more subtle realm. And this is what they find, uh, ended up calling the uh, tan matras again, sub, subtle elements, which in this uh, subtle realm, these subtle elements end up through combinations, making subtle forms in this kind of subtle matter, if you will, before actually manifesting in the physical growth. There are combinations of these tan matras that combine. Um, but their pure form uh, is found only in the uh, in the subtle realm, and from there, subtle forms, and from there, gross forms. So the five, and uh, many of you are uh, uh, familiar with these, but it was very interesting, just admit here, um, but it's very uh, interesting how the Rishis describe these, because they end up using what Chiobindo calls conventional symbols as they come across this substance, different substances in the subtle realm, they look around, which is what conventional uh, symbols are. They look around in the outer world, in their outer environment, and they try to find something that has a similar substance, a similar, a in a gross form, but similar attributes. Right? And so as we go through these five, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of quoting from Shirobindo because it's, again, another just very amazing uh, way that the Rishis uh, discover and perceive these. Um, the first, the first that they perceive was, was this, uh, or the original state of subtle matter, which is kind of the pure uh, ethereal of which the main characteristics are tenacity, or this lack of substance or thinness. Lack of substance or thinness, the Rishis uh, 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 
perceived and this pervasiveness. And they noticed that there was one sensible property, one property by which they could sense the existence or we could uh, sense the existence of, of uh, this particular element, which they called akasha eventually, and, and it's sound, shabda. So sound is this first evolved property of material substance. And, and we know that, you know, in the Bible, in the beginning was the word, right? The word is sound. So it, so sound perceives form and sound also has the power to create and destroy it. But the way they describe this is, and I'm just going to quote this, through Abinda's uh, commentary is looking around them, the Rishi's looking around them in the physical universe for a substance with these characteristics, Right, the characteristics of being a lacking substance or thinness and pervasiveness, they found it in the sky. They looked up and they saw the sky, Vion, and they called it Vion or uh, later Akasha. Akasha. And it meant in not just kind of the atmosphere uh, above, but what they implied or what they were implying by this symbol is that it was everything above our terrestrial world, that it was beyond and above our atmosphere and pervades everything. And that's how they were experiencing this, this pervasive connecting substance in the casual world. So they used the sky as the conventional symbol for this extremely delicate and light material. Um, and, uh, and they call it um, Akasha, Akasha or Vion sky. And then the second element, the next element that evolved from Akasha and was moving within it was what of this pure aerial or gaseous uh, condition, you know, of matter. They, they word these uh, as conditions of matter. And, and this was like lacking any substance or solidity. So here, due to pervasiveness, you know, to, to pervasiveness that we saw in the Akasha was added this new potency of sensible and varied emotion, right? And in this second power of matter, this new property of material substance evolved, touch or contact, right? Which wasn't there or at least wasn't fully developed in the pure Akash. So again, seeking for a physical substance in nature, characterized by motion. And what they saw was sort of this imperfect pervasiveness. It was irregular. It wasn't perfect like we had in Akash. And something that was not yet with form, but it could, it, it could be sensed by both sound and contact. And the Rishis found it in Vayu, in wind or air. Therefore, Vayu became the symbol, the conventional symbol for the second uh, condition of matter. And from there, fire, evolving out of this pure gaseous state and moving in it is this, this uh, they call it kind of this luminous um, energy, this luminous energy that's produced by heat. And in this stage, right, this pervasiveness that they saw in Akasha becomes still less subtle than it was. And this motion that they, they, they uh, sensed in the wind and Vayu it is no longer the major characteristic, but now energy, energy, um, and especially, uh, as Shiobindo says, formulative energy attains its full development and formation. Um, and its destruction at, at this stage. And so now as we look at fire or Agni, um, in addition to the sound and the contact, matter evolved a third property from fire, and that was form, right? Which couldn't be developed in pure air, right? Because it wasn't dense enough. Um, and, and obviously, uh, it was also kind of too volatile to form uh, an actual uh, structure or form. And so this power of matter um, that had light and heat uh, within it, um, the, again, the Rishis looked around 
And they saw that here in their terrestrial environment, that it had all the characteristics or many of the characteristics of fire. Because why fire? You can hear fire. It's crackling of fire. You can contact fire. You can touch the heat. Um, and it has form. You can see fire. So fire became the third element. And then they went on with water. Again, water being now this liquid state. And really, it's kind of the first, um, it's kind of the first principle in which this, this fluid could actually produce life, uh, if you will. Um, you know, we read in many places, I think even in the Rig Veda, all life is gathered out of the waters. And so life depends on this fluid principle uh, for its substance. And out of water, we had uh, the Rishis sense a fourth property, which was taste. So uh, water has, has a very uh, fluid, um, half volatile, half fixed, but perceptible by sound, contact, water, and taste. So the Rishis gave it the symbolic name of water to this fourth. And finally, we get to the, the state, the solid state, which was the last to progress out of this, this subtle uh, realm. And um, it has the most uh, extreme fixity. Fixity actually dominates. And as we know, it's really uh, the substratum of all solid forms and bodies. And the last necessity for the development of life, right? Because it provides life now with a fixed form or body in which it can, can work itself out, in which it can develop into an organism. And so this last sense of property of matter involved, this last sense that, that evolved was odor. Since earth is typically solid substance, you know, as they looked around and what, what, what has this property of sound, contact, form, and taste, it was earth. And so the Rishis gave uh, the conventional symbol Earth to this fifth. And again, these are not these are these are symbols of conditions of matter that are in the subtle realm. Now, to this, this is actually one of the major building blocks in Ayurveda, and to these subtle properties that the Rishis uh, perceived or cognized, Ayurveda adds another uh, eighteen or twenty subtle qualities for these uh, five tan mantras. And now we get to the last, uh, which is the gross uh, realm or gross uh, condition of matter. And here, obviously, we're familiar with the five gross elements that the rishis uh, just uh, use as conventional symbols, the air, ether, fire, water, and earth. And what Ayurveda does, it, it is certainly foundational to Ayurveda, but they go a step further and they, they group these five elements into um, kind of three basic functional uh, principles, which they call Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. So if you look at the picture, you'll see the top Vata, Vata is a combination of ether and air. Pitta, fire and water, although mostly fire. And kapha, water and earth, although mostly earth. And they realize, they, they group these uh, functions because these are the three functions that are required, um, especially within bodily form, but in all of nature. Right, we need we need vata. We need to uh, vata supports movement. Right, so we need movement, movement of breath, of muscles, of limbs, etc. Uh, another important function uh, which pitta satisfies is transformation. Transformation again within the body is this digestion of food. Right, and producing when it's mixed with water because pitta is also partly water produces chyme which is that fluidy substance that then passes into the small intestines. And the third is kapha. Kapha, again, earth and water, which supports all the antibiotic, antibiotic uh, processes in the body. So we have the building, we have the repairing, we have the healing of organs and tissues. 
So with these three, they are called actually doshas, vata, pitta, kapha, dosha. Now, you know, dosha translates um, as fault or impurity. But in the classical Ayurvedic tests, uh, the word dosha is actually used to mean organization. So we think of these as three different organizations. And Ayurveda to these three doshas identify seven different combinations. More, more vata than pitta and kapha, more pitta than kapha and, and vata, etc. So four sort of archetypal uh, combinations to these doshas. And Ayurveda sees these again as being universal to universal principles, really to all aspects of material creation, minerals, plants, animals. Um, they see it as being uh, functional to the time of day. Each, each uh, hour, even each hour or period of the time is defined as vata, pitta, or kapha. Um, the seasons, each of the seasons are also classified as vata, pitta, or kapha. And even, even the planets. Um, being a jyotishi, um, each uh, planet in Vedic astrology has a particular dosha, a particular mix, one of these seven archetypes, right? And it just happens to be in Vedic astrology that we use seven planets, and each one represents one of these archetypes. And, of course, each one also has a particular uh, a guna, uh, or Sattva, Rajas, or Thomas, but we won't go there for now. But it's this idea that these are universal principles that function everywhere, you know, whether whether it's the animal kingdom, the time of day, the seasons, the planets, human beings. So this th that means that this, this human physiology that embodies these principles are embodied everywhere. So everything in the whole universe gets connected in one way or another through these uh, through these three doshas, if you will. So just to, to summarize uh, a bit, right, back to these three states, we have the causal matter, which we said is bliss-filled state, and it really represents a soul or a spirit, which Ayurveda acknowledges. Um, it's the subtle matter, which comes out of the causal, uh, which includes the three gunas, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, which Ayurveda adds uh, 16 various combinations. It's the five tan mantras and their subtle qualities, which Ayurveda gives 20 qualities to. And then on the gross level, it recognizes five gross elements, but it groups them into three functional categories. And of those three functional categories, which is composed of vata, pitta, and kapha, there are seven uh, main uh, archetypes, if you will. So I think one of the things that this picture shows and um, why I like it so much is that it really, uh, really illustrates how everything, all manifestation ultimately came from the same source, right? This causal state this causal realm of substance that was perceived by the rishis as being pure, blissful existence or pure ananda, pure love. So everything in the manifest universe is birthed out of this substance. And this is why Ayurveda also maintains that everyone, everyone, there is this, this oneness that supports the universe, this oneness that creates a that this um, substance, this causal substance that creates the oneness and that oneness supports kind of the unity in the world. And uh, one of the um, one of the quotes in the uh, earlier Ayurvedic texts, uh, what is there in what the, what is there in the external cosmos is existing within this body and vice versa. Both are one and the same when one realizes thyself. So at the root, with the foundation, we have this, this uh, notion or this belief um, that we are all one and the same uh, in the universe. We, there is a oneness or unity amongst all because of these uh, creation principles, if you will. 
And then we have Alan Watts saying something similar in 1960. The first quote was back from 500 BC when we have uh, many of the uh, classical Ayurvedic texts being codified. But the, the next one, which wasn't too long ago, um, Alan Watts in 1960, you are the universe experiencing itself. Right, the same notion. And then finally, and one of my favorite, Eckhart Tolle in 1980, you are not in the universe, you are the universe, an intrinsic part of it. Ultimately, you are not a person, but a focal point where the universe is becoming conscious of itself. What an amazing miracle. So as we awaken, the universe awakens. Right? So all this again uh, is a you know part of the spiritual and philosophical foundation of Ayurveda. So let me just uh, go to now a couple summary uh, slides that will uh, hopefully pull all this together. Um, if we look now at the building blocks for Ayurveda, which are taken from the language and symbols for creation. What we said is at the outermost realm, at the gross realm, there's five gross elements and their functional combinations, vata, pitta, and kapha. And out of vata and pitta and kapha, there's seven different combinations, if you will, seven doshic types that you see at the bottom there. To that, in the subtle realm, we have these tan mantras, and uh, they're behind the gross elements and doshas. And there's 20 subtle elements that Ayurveda uses. These are actually more critical than the doshas, believe it or not, because these are supporting. These are, if you will, forming in the subtle realm, the doshas that are going to manifest physically. And then lastly, we mentioned the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. And out of that, Ayurveda classifies 16 different combinations. So seven doshi combinations, 20 subtle elements, 16 psychological combinations of the three gunas. These are all the different permutations that combine in total to provide diversity, provide diversity within this oneness that we just saw in the universe. Yes? Ayurveda says we are all one. There is a oneness. We all come and are made of the same substance, but we are also each unique. And this uniqueness is, is uh, critical to Ayurveda and its results in, again, the acknowledgement of the many different combinations of the seven doshic uh, combinations, the 20 subtle elements, and the 16 psychological typecasting can produce. And none of these are uh, none of these are viewed in Ayurveda as independent. Um, it's not like we look at the mind and classify it by one of the sixteen different uh, typecasts, and then we look at the body and we say, "Well, what doshic and maybe what elements?" They're all interlinked, interdependent in Ayurveda. And so Ayurveda understands that these psychological attributes or gunas in a person actually influences the physical constitution and its functioning, the doshas, right, and its operations, and the opposite, that the physical constitution and its functioning influences the psychological attributes in a person. So they're intermixed and inter intertwined and constantly in interaction with each other. So what Ayurveda does with all this is that, again, they come up with uh, unique patterns in nature that they see that represents these different combinations of gunas, qualities, and doshas, right? Just as the rishis in the Isha Upanishad um, looked around their outer environment, their outer nature, to find a symbol that would have reflect some truth behind it. Um, so too did uh, these uh, the Ayurvedic. Um, uh, I don't know if you call them authors or those that cognized uh, Ayurveda looked around in the external environment 
and found unique patterns in nature to reflect these different combinations. Now, there's many combinations, right? We can get over 100, but they classified starting primarily with three and then seven, and then they refine it. So the very basic patterns, which is the, the physical typecasting, if you will, is a Vata person, right? A Vata person is what? Mostly air and space. So we have thin, tall, long legs, long arms. We have a very specific pattern occurring um, in nature that is a prototype for uh, the Vata person and so on with the pitta and with the kapha person. So recognizing these patterns in nature as symbols, right, of what lies behind the form, right? This is just the conventional, the outer form, but the Ayurvedic uses these conventional symbols to inform him not only the physical constitution of the individual, but also their physiological strengths and weaknesses, their personal functional habits, whether they'll be susceptible to different illnesses or diseases, what their mental and emotional aptitude and, and attributes are like, and so on. It's an, it's an entire archetype, if you will, that's bundled and illustrated by this outer uh, symbol occurring in nature, which is the pat pattern of the physical body. So um, the last uh, slide, and then we can uh, open it up for uh, discussion. Sorry, this has taken a little longer than I uh, had thought. But um, here, I think uh, Plato's aphorism becomes very relevant to Ayurveda. Um, Plato says, it is far more important to know what type of person suffers from a disease rather than what disease the person is suffering from. So this is really in Ayurveda. They look first and foremost as to the type of person, and then they begin to analyze the disease because that disease will, will mutate and show uh, differently depending on what, uh, what the outer form is. Vata Pitta Kapha, along with the different uh, qualities and gunas. So with that, I'm just going to open it up, and I'm hoping that uh, this kind of tied together and uh, and it made sense, and I didn't lose anyone. But please, any any comments, questions, your own experience with Ayurveda, we'd love to we'd love to hear. You can unmute yourself and speak. I made it possible, so please go ahead. First of all, Radhe, this was just beautiful. Thank you so much. It was just amazing, this presentation. I had one question. So can this, I'm sure, it, but I need your explanation. This can also be related to yin and yang, right? Ayurveda, the... Balance. Oh, yin and yang is, is Chinese. Do we have uh, do we have Teresa? I think oh, Teresa and Charles. Um, let's turn to them and get their uh, thoughts or ideas on this. My, I mean, my my thing is yes, but I really I'm not. Let's find two people more schooled and familiar with that symbol. Well, the 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 idea for for me anyway is that. Um, when we start seeing it from symbols, then our meaning is ascribed to the symbols. So we can take any symbols and ascribe our meaning to it, depending upon our perception or, or our, our beliefs. So I know very little about um, Ayurvedic medicine, um, but however, there are some principles in it that are common to more the field of seeing it from sacred geometry, per se. Like, um, for example, when you had the causal, the subtle, and the gross, right? right. Um, then, then, then for me, what I was hearing was that the, the yin and the yang of it would be the causal 
and the gross gross would be um, how am I going with this? And anyway, the the subtleness is transitional phase, right? Going from subtle to gross, and it's the in the yin yang sim, symbol where you have the black and the white meeting. That line at which they meet is called the Ling Shu, which means the cosmic hinge. And so, so in sacred geometry, where two opposites meet or two things that are different meets, that creates a transitional gradient feedback zone. So, so everything happens, everything happens in the cosmic hinge, which is really interesting to me to, because I'm translating my my projections on onto your question, but I think the, the the commonality in it is that you're looking at um, you're looking at subtle and you're looking at gross and or causal and you're looking at growth and then there is a transitional zone which is in there and that transitional zone and the yin yang or the Taiji two symbol is that black which is called the cosmic hinge. And then that that creates a dual or an opposite that allows there to be a feedback loop. So it's not just that I think that um, uh, it's only a one way street between uh, subtle and and gross, right? It's a feedback loop, and that Absolutely. is and that is how consciousness moves through the field. Um, which, interestingly enough, the field when I was listening to it is that um, that 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 ocean, right? And then you have ripples on the ocean from desire. What I'm hearing in that is the is the field, is kshetram, and the description of the field. So then then we can extrapolate any information from that particular model and put Ayurvedic onto it or, or put uh, classical Chinese medicine. And we'll see commonalities that, that are common, common to the symbols, not necessarily common to the language. We, the symbols become a, a codex, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a way to translate and to begin to see the unity of all things because they share a same fundamental structure. Right. All right. And, um, All right. So I kind of went off and on I that, guess, that, you know, that was just stream of consciousness. And, uh, I think that that feedback loop that you're mentioning, and thank you so much uh, for that, Charles, that feedback loop that you're mentioning, that's exactly what we're, what Ayurveda sees as one of the loops being between the gunas, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, and the qualities, these 20 qualities that are more subtle, and eventually the gross body and the dosha. There's constantly one impacting the other. There's this constant interdependency and in activity happening. And this is why, you know, uh, a mental mindset that is perhaps too tamasic or too rajasic, too fearful, too afraid, too anxious, that influences obviously the subtle qualities of the body, which ultimately can manifest in a physical disease, right? So this is constantly, this loop between these three are constantly influencing and you change any one and you can influence the other. Um, so that's how I see in Ayurveda that this feedback loop that you were mentioning, uh, Thank Charles. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Are the five Tan Mantras also known as the Panch Mahabhutas? Uh, the five uh, gross elements are the Panch Mahabhutas. So the outer uh, manifestation of these Tan Mantras that the Rishis perceive ends up being the uh, Mahabhutas. Uh, Mahabhutas. Oh, so the outer manifestations are called Panch Mahabhuta and the, the <clears throat> essence or the inner beings, inner elements are the five Tana Mantras. Thank you so much. Mm, tan Mantras. Yeah, the five kind of uh, conditions. Yeah. yeah. Thank Arade. you so much. Rade. Yes. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, so another similarity is that um, uh, the the Chinese medicine has the 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 feel in Chinese medicine are these five phases that are reduced down to these symbols of elements. So have the same five phases, and then um, also in um, and and the geometries, uh, the Platonic solids were named after Plato, and Plato had ascribed um, the complete breakdown of the creation to these five geometric forms that are called the Platonic mm. solids, and he ascribed different elements to the solids. So we're back into this the five, you know, symbology, yep. and we're also into the geometry that unifies these two, these various schools of thought. But when you go to the geometries, then you can use that as a codex to start to decipher some of these other uh, similarities because consciousness is one. And <laughs> I think it's just different uh, levels of understanding and brain development and, you know, kind of social engineering that happened on the planet from unforeseen, unseen forces that are involved here as far as our development. But there's a commonality to all of these things which can be found in, in the geometries, which is, you know, when we do our presentation, it really is going to show all the geometries as a symbol of how consciousness is moving through itself to become self-aware and then it's easy to it's easy to just see things in in the way that i'm sharing with you if you're interested yeah, yeah. no no this is this is amazing and yes uh charles and Teresa will be uh doing the sunday sangha in two or three weeks here to elaborate more on uh on this this topic so yeah thank you definitely for that in, any other comments, no. thoughts? No. Yeah. Um, first, thank you. As many people were saying, it was a wonderfully integral, comprehensive presentation. I loved especially how you really brought out that the Ayurvedic discipline like astrology can be used to refer all things back to the one. So I, my comment is I love that. I remember my Ayurvedic practitioner saying, I can give you lists of things doshas for food and exercise and all that. But what I suggest you do is as you walk around all day, begin to tune into these qualities and doshas and you'll start, and same with the elements in astrology, you'll find them everywhere. And as you get quieter yeah. and quieter and open to that, it's like this miraculous array of symbolic presentations of the divine. So I, and I thought you really brought, brought it out beautifully. So I, just want to say I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's a good point because one of the things that Dr. Lodd had us do when we were in school was that he made um, us go out for two or three days in a row. And everything we saw, we had to see if we could connect what the qualities were behind it, right? To get used to, to these 20 qualities that really end up manifesting uh, gross, uh, gross matter, if you will. And anything obviously has two or three. And so getting, like you're saying, tuning in and getting familiar with these qualities and how they manifest on the outer side, their form or pattern uh, in nature, if you will. Um, I also just wanted to say that um, even in the classical texts, uh, Jyotish, Vedic astrology is mentioned. The planets are mentioned. There are gemstones associated with each of the planets that match their, match their dosha and their guna. And these, these gemstones are ground up. And not here in the U.S., it hasn't been approved, but in India, then this is one of the remedies that you can take. So there's this linking. Uh, these sciences, in my mind, Jyotish, Vastu, Palmistry, Ayurveda, all used to be one. Also, all, all one and much more synergistic than what we're practicing them today. We've kind of parsed them all out as, I believe, we got more into the Kali Yuga and unable to hold all this uh, information together. But at one time, and I believe this one time was probably the golden age in India, 400 to 600 BC, where these were all the same. The Ayurvedic practitioner was also a Jyotishi, was also practiced Vastu. You know, because you see these inner links between the shastras of these amazing uh, sciences and arts. So, 
Yeah. I have a question. Sure, Jane. Yeah, um, I'm still at a beginning stage of understanding all of this. And I was looking, as you were talking about the uh, three doshas, you were talking about there were two parts that were not connected, or uh, if you will, and that's ether and fire and air and earth. If you look at the diagram you showed, there were, I think, like, I don't know, six different connections but they but you only had three different okay if you go back up to the diagram yeah and you don't have anything for e earth for ether and fire or air and earth yeah good 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 observation <laughs> good sign so all of these are within each other. You know, within Earth, we're going to have water, fire, ether, air. Even within ether, we're going to have some of these other, other elements. The same with the Buddhas. What uh, Ayurveda does is they take their elements and they look at how these elements naturally uh, perform biologically, if you will, within the body, and which elements tend to come together to support functions in the body uh, versus others. And what they notice is that, well, ether and air, it comes together to support the movement in the body, the movement of air, the movement of nutrients, the movements of the muscles, and so on. With pitta and some water, it's more the digestive, the transformational, breaking food down, breaking thoughts and ideas down, right? And then earth and water for, for really building the, 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 the health and the muscles of the, of the organs and, and what have you. So it's not that, um, it's, it's that in nature, these three combinations are naturally inherent in the body's functioning. Um, and not that we couldn't have some air and earth, but they don't, they don't really come together. You don't see them anywhere in the biological processes that are happening within the body. Um, but still, each and every dosha has, has to have all these elements in it. Some are just more dominant than, uh, than others. So I don't know if that uh, answers, Jane, your, your question. Well, yeah, it does. Okay. Basically, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And I know that we're we're over. I really uh, appreciate people staying. Yes. There is one more Sangeeta Sahi who's raising hand. Oh, I just had a comment about that because <clears throat> uh, um, I I had the same uh, thought that the mandala wasn't complete with just the three uh, combinations, and I thought that the ether and the fire. Uh, would probably support the nervous system. It's the nervous, the nerves are an electromagnetic system, which they might not have known about back then. Um, and the the air and the water I saw as the uh, the breath, the the lungs and the blood that carry the oxygen. And I'm I'm not sure if they're how they. Um, I'm not sure of the process back way back when it was formed of um, how they how they looked at the in, in, inner body and the outer uh, environment. So what I would um, say to that is that we do start to see some of these different combinations when we get into what Ayurveda calls the seven dhatus or the seven tissues of the body. And so one being circulation, another being meta, the fat system, right? So, so all of these at, at the systems level, now we start to see more interplay between these uh, different doshas and, and the elements. So eventually, yes, it does work its way into, uh, into Ayurveda, absolutely. That can be of course. Uh, Sangeeta, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rade, thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanted to share that the I'm, a, I'm actually by background a medical doctor, but I've been really um, 
intuitively immersed in integrality and integral yoga and health. And I presented with Nama, I presented with uh, the Aurobindo Ashram in Pondicherry. And what I did was also look at the DNA. So when um, Jan, I think it was Jan and Don mentioned about um, the, the actual geometry and the DNA and its functionality. And it's, it's the bridge between the Ayurvedic subtle um, datus and all of the rest into the processing at the physical. So the actual shape and geometry is actually very, very important as the codice. And I will share this with you. I'm, we haven't proved it yet in terms of, because I've worked with quantum physicists and biophysicists where we actually had technical equipment where we could verify and look at the meridian system at the, and the chakras inside a, a body and see the changes that occur when different different behaviors are expressed. But I'm pretty certain that Savitri is written through the same codex, which is why Nir al Fasa, the mother, insisted that it was read and understood and continuously because it was layers and layers which would then get embodied within the human system's um, uh, system through the, the DNA and and the reading of it. So this is, I mean, I'm really happy. And the funny, the other synergy, which is really funny, is I've also worked with Dr. Vasant Lad. Yeah. And so anyway, thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Um, again, thank you for staying with me. And uh, Don, we look forward next week for your presentation. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.